Finally, the water began to go down, and we finally got down to uh, Point Pleasant. Stayed around there for a day or two, then and we eventually got a boat from Point Pleasant to the, to uh, Huntington, I believe it was, and we got the train from Huntington on back on, back home. Well, high water has always been a problem in this area, then, hasn't it? Huh? I say high water has apparently always been a problem. Yeah, in this yeah well, area. yeah, we were, right, we were living right here at that time, right here on North Rand Street. Water got in our house. Mother and them had gone to the up on the hill of my aunt's up there where Nellie and them live now. Where, you know, and, 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 and water was up for a day or two. We, we were stranded down there. We couldn't, 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 really couldn't get home but we were train off water for the, till the, till the water went down over the track. Well, the uh, appliance man told me today that I'll have to have a new washing machine because that last water that we had in our basement up in Ganaw City ruined the ba the motor. It's just ruined beyond repair. So well, I mean, water is always a problem maybe, around here. Maybe get a new motor, can't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the point That's is, like new last summer the clear. Hunter family lost their three children with high water and floods. It's you know, and then we had the Buffalo Creek flooding, and water seems to be the natural uh, casualty in 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 our valley. Well, mm -hmm. I've seen it all up around here, right in here, in this section here, all along Capitol Street. See it right down on Capitol Street, Capitol and Virginia Street. Is that so? Yeah, indeed. Capitol and Virginia Street. All this a low section all in here on. Around uh, Donnelly and Court Street, that's, uh, that's where it first began to come into the city, back up from the, from the river, come up through those sewers there, all up here on Capitol. All right. I'm not uh, your mother, Capitolia Casey. While she was teaching here in the Charleston School, and um, where did you meet her? Did you meet her here or down Gal Place? No, I met her, at, met her here. At a, Let's we'll see how did we first meet. I thought you went to Gal Police. Gal Police is always known for its Oh, I did. Uh, we, we went down there often. Yeah, I was going to Gal Police before you before I met your mother. You, the girl down there named her, her name Lola Wilson and she called it Gal Police. When we used to have playing in the band around here, we we used to go down to Gal Police and we we got we got carried away with the girls down there so one time we 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 missed the train. Mm -hmm. He's going. To, used to have Sunday excursions to Gal Place, mm -hmm. and and uh, we, we, the band used to go down. And used to play for the railroad. We'd go down to Gal Place, and and uh, they always had a nice park there and a nice bandstand. So we were always glad to go. There were lots of girls there too, and so we. Uh, We would go up to the. Uh, of course, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't meet Captain then, but she was. Uh, when we when we used to play in the band down there, I met her after we, after she began to teach, and she and uh, and. Uh, what other girl named this? Oh. Don't get this way, my friend. Yeah, we, I used to drive a 
and I got with nearly every, nearly every Sunday, every other Sunday. Well, I don't know. sometimes I'd bring Capitolia back with me, and uh, I, I, they roomed over there in, this, in that historic house, I think. Mm -hmm. I know you told me that before. Yeah, uh, uh, she and, and uh, Cecil, what was that other girl? Cecil Star. Uh, well, I remember, but I can't uh, think of her last name. I remember uh, pictures. I've seen pictures. Uh, yeah, uh, no. Uh, and then there's another girl from Chicago. Uh, Cecil Miller. Uh, yeah, Cecil Miller. Uh, mm -hmm. Cecil was over there, and and, and a girl from, from, uh, taught here from Chicago. She roomed there too. Uh, let me see why did Capitola stay the most time when she was yeah. Well I guess she married you pretty soon after she came. <laughs> well I guess she, you were married pretty soon after she came. Yeah. But what uh, was doing Yeah, we went uh Capitolia had gone to school at Ohio University. Yeah. And Mr. Lacey, over in Athens, Mr. Lacey, Fred Lacey, who taught at Institute, told me that he was a student there while she was there, and he knew her. Mm -hmm. But it was a long time, for as long as we worked together before he retired, that he realized that she was my mother. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting experience for who, me. Who was that? Mr. Lacey, who was head of the vocational uh, industrial uh, technology, they call it now, yeah. Department of at State College. Yeah, uh -huh. He was from down in, uh, is it not Goodwell? What's that other town close to Parkersburg across the river from mm. Parkersburg in Ohio? Well, I forget now. Well, that was where he lived, and he was a student at Ohio University in Athens while my mother was there. Well, um, uh, she taught the first grade because Jack Green, I think, was in the class. He was someone that I remember when I was growing up here who used to tell me that my mother was his first grade teacher. And that wasn't uh, mm -hmm. Mally Brown in that class. And some, I'm trying to think of some of the other people from Charleston who, who were around here, who were here at that time. And I know Mrs. Norman's mother used to tell me all the time, Mrs. Stevens, that she had in her possession the shoes that she wore to my mother's wedding when you and she were married. Who was that? Mrs. Stevenson, Thel yeah. Ruth Norman and Thelma Gregory's mother, uh, uh -huh. used to tell me that she had the shoes uh, that she wore to the wedding. So where were you, Mary? Here or in Galapagos? Mm -hmm. uh, Galapagos. Mm -hmm. All right, now, she what about your business by, activities at that time? Were you were you Galapagos and, and uh, we left. Go, please. Mm. In my car, I had a car. Is that that Buick that I've seen <laughs> pictures of? And it went on up to the door. Let's see what it be. Uh, uh, I think we. We went to her. She had, you had an aunt that lived in, in uh, Harrisburg. Do you remember anything about her? Not in Harrisburg. I know about no, 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 wait a minute. I had Aunt Louise, Aunt Lizzie in Chicago, and Aunt Louise was in uh, mm -hmm. uh, Birmingham, Binghamton, New York. It might not have been a relative of yours there, because uh, I think we, we spent the night there. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we stayed there probably one night, because I know we went out the next day. We went, we, we went up in the park, and I remember I... I we, we took some pictures up there. There was an old uh, uh, ornament there, old, uh, something like a little bit. Oh, I, I don't know what it was. That anyhow, up, up in the park, there's a, there's a statue there of something over there. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I snapped. Kept told his picture and she got mine up on this old, uh, I don't know what it was, but I what, what was it? Uh, 
But you got what? the picture. Huh? You got the picture, though. I think I've seen the picture, too. Yeah, was that when you went to Atlantic City also, Dad? Because I know I've seen pictures of you and Capitolia in Atlantic City. Uh, yeah, we went, we, we went, we stayed in, we stayed in Harrisburg overnight, maybe a day or something like that. And we went, we, uh, this woman, we stayed with her, supposed to be our aunt or our, she was some close, relative of the family, I know, and, and, uh, and we went from Harrisburg, let's see, we went, to, to, we went to, from there, I think we went over to Atlantic City, and then we went, to, let's see, I know, I know we took some pictures there. She kept took a picture of that. That was in, that was in Langley City or uh, Coney Island. I know she, cause she, she wrote over that picture. She called me Jack Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Johnson. I thought it was a water and it was a bathing suit, see. Mm -hmm. Then we saw Miss Norman in Atlantic City, I think. Yeah, oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Ruth Norman and Lucy Lucy Cage. Julia's mother, Julia. We had pictures of them there. There, you know. I got. To, I had. A, uh, I hope those albums haven't got destroyed. I, I've got I think a lot, they're still around. Of, I'm sure they are. Yeah, we were. Well, that's fine. Well, we'll continue tomorrow. Just our Yeah, well, after. I left you downstairs. I went up in my room and found the the album with all of those old timers in it, and, and I stayed up there and I didn't return till after twelve o'clock. Well, I was in bed because I went up at at eleven when the news went off last night. But it is interesting to see the album. There are Mr. and Mrs. Powell, mm -hmm. Ruth Norman, uh, Mr. W. W. Saunders, the mm -hmm. uh, so many of your old friends who yeah. are still around. So what are you going to talk about this evening, Dad? Well, let's see. I don't know. You haven't talked about Mr. Kimbrough. Mm -hmm. Well, if I talk about him, then I'll have to start talking about the uh, property, the corner of Washington. And I, I found a letter last night up there that uh, I'm not, not, not talking, don't take it. I'm just saying I found a letter that uh, a fellow wrote to Gurney Ferguson. And uh, I want to, well, I, I want to, Mentioned Gurney too, someplace along the line there, because I uh, wanted to buy this property from him, and, and he wrote this fellow and told him that he would take it up with me, and and uh, and uh, if I was interested in selling, why well, then they, they would fix a price on it and 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 demand a ten thousand dollar. Uh, for an option, but I wasn't anxious to sell, so we dropped the matter. But uh, after Ferguson and I bought the property, have I, I've already mentioned that, haven't I? No, you haven't talked about that at all. Yes, I did. I think we I'm talked about roughing my night, but we don't have it on tape. Uh -huh. You haven't mentioned that at all. You've been talking about your family no. and your childhood. You haven't gotten into well. much business. I would want to take time and think it through. Okay, well we'll get, get it organized. We don't have any place. At all to go, see. When you and Mr. Ferguson bought the property? So Ferguson and I bought that.
corner somewhere, and he, he said he would build a hotel and and a restaurant. And uh, I said, well, I'll build some, some business rooms, a place for a, a restaurant, a hot dog stand, drug store, uh, barbershop, cleaning and barber pressing. Barbershop, cleaning and pressing. Pool room. Uh, Ferguson had a pool room in his place. I, I, didn't, I didn't have any pool room in my place at that particular time, but later on I did. I did uh, put a pool room in. His uh, grandma was Kimbo. Where did he fit in? Oh, yeah, yeah he, he was there with me for. I'm going to mention him. And uh, after I. Ferguson built a hotel. He had a barber shop, a restaurant, pool room, and uh, sleeping rooms upstairs in the hotel. I built <coughs> my office room. Uh, a hot dog stand was operated by a Greek fellow by the name of Pappas, and I, I had a drug store. It was operated by a, a Dr. Dickerson and Solomon at a later date. And and I had a shoe repairing shop, cleaning and pressing shop, and uh, a taxi taxi stand. We office. What about the printing press? Printing printing shop. And you you press. said. You said Dickerson and Solomon. You meant to say Mitchell and Solomon, didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the drugstore. Mm-hmm. Uh, Did Mr. Ferguson build the theater at the same time that he built the theater? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Did Walter uh, Hallinan, what, was he involved in that in any way? No. No, he... He was, he got uh, Ferguson's job, or a state job, uh, which paid him pretty good money. He was head of the, uh, what is that? Uh, Bureau of Negro Welfare. Bureau of Negro Welfare? Yeah. Ferguson, through uh, Senator Walter Hallinan, Captain Ferguson was appointed head of the Negro Welfare Bureau. <laughs> and <coughs> did I mention that I I had a number of of uh, Office rooms and sleeping rooms upstairs mm -hmm. in my place, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my building. Do you remember when the building was completed, Dad? Did you and Cap Ferguson complete both of your buildings at the same time? Just about, yes. Mm -hmm. Did you have a grand opening for it, or yeah. did they just open for business? Well, did you have difficulty renting the business rooms? Or? No, we didn't have any trouble running it. We, we, we got them equipped. And, and if the tenant wasn't able to equip them, the captain and I helped them <coughs> to uh, equip them. Now, 
Now, his family lived there for a long time, didn't they, at the hotel? Cat Ferguson. No, oh, they lived there a while, yes. They lived there a long time. Yeah, they lived there. All, the time, all through our high school days, they were living yeah, there. Yeah, they lived in... They lived on the third floor of the hotel. And then he built a, a great yeah. long ranch house down in uh, Pinewood Park in West Dunbar, where the Ferguson family lives now. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, after Ferguson sold, sold out, yeah, he, well, he, he had a fire, and his hotel was partially destroyed by fire, and... Uh, uh, later on, he uh, sold to the Heart of Town Hotel and built him a home down at the subdivision that he and Lonesome? Several, Roy Lonesome and several other fellows had developed and built a nice home down there called Pine Wood Park. It's, it's located near West Virginia State College on the hill. While I'm talking now about Mr. Ferguson, I, I would like to mention the fact that he is now very, very sick. He's, he's in a hospital. Oh, is he? And he's in very, very serious condition. He's not able to help himself or even walk now. Well, yeah. in order to be authentic, Discuss the forty thousand dollar note that he took with Mac Davis. What did it? With the bank. What about it? The forty thousand dollar note that Mac Davis closed in on him with. Oh, bank yeah. of commerce. Uh, yeah, yeah. The he owed the bank <coughs> neighborhood of forty odd thousand dollars, and these. Heart of town hotel people were anxious to get the, the property after it was partially destroyed by fire, and uh, they uh, they bought the Ferguson. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say just how much, but I wasn't sure of that, see. I, I, he, owned, he owned the bank a considerable sum, and the bank was demanding payment. However, they, they, they bought it. So what did you tell Mr. Brown when it, when it came to you? Huh? What did you, you tell the bankers when they came to you? Well, after they bought first, they thought then they would buy me out. Well, I told them, I said, now, if you get mine, you're going to pay me my, my price. <laughs> so you've got Ferguson for practically nothing, but if you get mine, you're going to pay, pay me my price, what I'm asking for. And uh, so they made, I said, you make me an offer and I'll consider it. They, they first made me an offer of, of uh, $80,000, I think it was. I, I said, no, nothing doing. I said, I'm not interested. And uh, I said, now listen, let me tell you. You got Ferguson's for practically nothing, but if you get mine, you're going to pay me my price for mine. Not your price, but my price. So they went all the way from eighty thousand dollars up to uh, up to uh, 
up to uh, ninety thousand, a hundred and ninety thousand dollars, and I refused that. And <clears throat> then I I said, now if you want my property, you're gonna have to pay me a two hundred and ten thousand dollars. Well, they had hesitated and hummed and hauled. Finally, they finally they offered me two hundred thousand. I said, so I, I talk it over with my son Bullard and my daughter, and I said, well, I think that's a, a top price. I don't think they they want it bad, but I don't think they can. <laughs> They will go over two hundred thousand, but uh, right at this time, and I'm not very well, and I'd like to get my business straightened up while I'm in good buying and fairly good health. So I agreed to sell them for two hundred thousand cash. Well, after what came out in the paper today, I guess you're glad you got cash. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what happened? Yeah. yeah. So, so they they agreed to pay me two hundred thousand, which they did, and I just went. I I I just went a few hundred feet on the on the same street. And put me up a fireproof business building, which cost me a neighborhood of $150,000, which I'm now occupying as my office, my daughter, my son, the lawyer, his office, and two barber shops, a restaurant. In a doctor's office, and up, uh, and up on the second floor, I have an office built up there. I have a government set up there called a PAD. I have a, a dentist, Doctor Baskerville, dentist, and, and my son's off law office, and. Uh, Another lawyer, another lawyer up there by the name of Booker Stevens. Booker Stevens, and that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's that's about all. Practically all my rooms on the second all second floor are occupied. And, and, and you and might mention that uh, while while the downstairs. Rear corner room was uh, was not occupied. They use it in connection with the um, they use it in connection with the garbage workers' strike last year. And then during the Prince Hunter family tragedy, when three children were drowned last summer, they used that for offices for soliciting yeah, funds. Well, and, and, uh, we have a barber shop there. I have, I have two barber shops in the building. Yes. One operated by. Mr. David Scott, who had been running for me for more than 30 years. And also associated he, with you in real estate. And, and he's also a real estate uh, salesman for me. And, Dr. Nelson. and another young man had a barber shop there by the name of... Um, uh, Crawford. What's called the first name? I don't know, but everybody calls him Kelly. Crawford's Barbershop. And Dr. Nelson. Dr. Nelson. Yeah, well, I mentioned Dr. Nelson. Mm -hmm. He's on the first, on the ground floor. Beside mm -hmm. girl. Mm-hmm. We, we have on, on the uh, four rooms being occupied on the ground floor facing... Shrewsbury Street, I have a, a, a restaurant, a nice restaurant, and uh, Mr. David Scott 
who had been running for me for more than 30 years. He was in the old building, and uh, we have a restaurant there now being occupied by a lady by the name of Lily Watkins. L L Lily Watkins. Brockman? Watkins. Lily Brockman. Watkins. Watkins. Watson. Yeah, Lily Watson. Uh, you might mention uh, who the people were who, who built your building, Dad. I remember uh, going up yeah. on a crane. That was the... Uh, yeah. My business. Well, I might mention also, but uh, my building was built by uh, the masonry work was all done by colored masons. Was done by all colored. The contractor for the masonry, his name was James Bumpus. Now, what about the um, electrical, uh, I mean, the uh, carpentry work? The carpentry work was done by a colored man uh, by the name of... Uh, Gentry? Gentry Thompson. And your air conditioning, air conditioning. heating, and cooling? The, the, air, the, the, the building is completely air-conditioned all electric, was done by a colored man by the name of... James Nolan. James Nolan. And your plumbing? The plumbing was done by, also by colored man by the name of Tobe Melton. What about your electrical work then? The electrical work was done by a uh, Yaron. white uh, contracting concern by the name of Yared. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there who's his first name? I can't remember, but he, he always asked about Yared. Yared. Mm -hmm. Um well, let's see. It just about takes care of it. Mm -hmm. Just about takes care of it. The building was completed in 1971, wasn't it? I remember it was in your 91st year that the building was uh, completed, so that mm -hmm. would make it back in 71. I don't recall. Yeah, it was. And your name is on the front. It's located right beside the First Baptist Church. This, this building is located on... Join the... First Baptist Church, and the size of our the lot that the building is on is 80 feet front, 150 feet deep to an alley. And what have you just recently removed on the rear of that lot? You had a storage uh, room had a back story, there. Yeah, I had a, a storage room. I removed the storage room in order to make make a space for more parking space. Uh, we are now able to park 18 or 20 cars on the on the uh, property. All right. So now, with Heart of Town utilizing all the space that they purchased from Mr. Ferguson, plus the rest of that block that would go from. Uh, the alley over to uh, Broad Street, and now they have built their uh, addition, which would include your former property, back to your new building so that the heart of town has the entire block and First Baptist Church and your office occupies the remaining space, so it's located in prime property and right indeed in the heart of town. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine. We'll finish another time. This building is free of all debts and encumbrances. And I am turning it over in trust 
after giving my son, lawyer Willardell Brown, free office space, and my daughter, Della Brown Taylor, who is a real estate broker also, uh, <coughs> free room, free rent, as long as they wish to continue to occupy the uh, the, the, the quarters. quarters. Let's see if something else will happen. Who holds the trust then? The Charleston National Bank will have complete charge of of uh, handling the affairs for at least 20 years. This is the 12th of January, 1974. And uh, we're going to resume taping today by listening to some of Dad's uh, reminiscences concerning uh, attorney C.E. Kimbrough, uh, who shared an office with him for a long, long time. All right, Dad, when did you and Mr. Kimbrough uh, decide to sort of go into business together? How did your association come about? How long had you known him, and where was he from, and so on? I must give credit to attorney C.E. Kimbrough, who was associated with me in my office for a number of years. He had the reputation of being one of the most able land title abstractors of any lawyer in the city. He helped me quite a bit. in many ways by uh, advising me you look when, when uh, purchasing property. Mm -hmm. Can you remember some of the transactions that you and he were engaged in, Dan? Attorney Kimbrough and, and I had many real estate deals together. He and I purchased a track of land joining the West Virginia State College that was owned by Howard Harper and his brothers. Were they white or were they black? No, uh, Harper's, 
Howard Harper was well well known. He was an attorney, and at at one time appointed to a federal job in Washington. Why were they anxious to sell the property? The property was owned by Mr. Harper and his brothers and sisters, and uh, they uh, wanted to uh, divide it up. Do you remember how much you and Mr. Kimbrough paid for it? We, it had already been laid off in as a subdivision. It, it was called the Harper Edition at Institute. Mr. Kimbrough and I bought this land. I don't just remember if what we paid for it, but we sold off quite a few lots and made some improvements on the property. And later, We sold the, un <coughs> the balance of our holdings to uh, let's see. Uh, Was it someone connected with the college? No, no, we sold it to the airport. Oh, the, the airport land down there? Mm -hmm. The land where the airport was before Carbide took the property. Mm -hmm. what, why didn't the college think about buying any of that land? Well, they just didn't have foresight enough, that's all. But however, we, what did I say last? You said that you sold it to... You, you sold some of it to the airport, to the people who were going to build an airport, the city for, or the whoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's, uh, who, to whom did the airport belong? Was it a state, federal, or what uh, was the connection mm -hmm. there? No, it was... wasn't privately owned, private, was it? It was a private... Uh, when it was first organized, it was a private. You know. I see. Uh, uh, site. Which was, which was later taken over by the chemical plant. Mm -hmm. The rubber all, plant. All of the land <coughs> west of the State College property was taken over by the chemical plant. Now, uh, Mr. Kimbrough and you then were, uh, you sold most of that. You don't have any, you haven't had any of that property for a long time, have no, you? No, we mm -hmm. sold all, we, all of our holdings there. Uh -huh. Now, what other what other transactions do the two of you do you recall? Where where had he gone to school, Dad? How did he happen to set up an office with you? Where had he gone to school, Dad? How did he happen to set up an office with you? Was he from Charleston? I, I, I'd like to know. I know that certainly his wife's family. Or old Charlestonian. 
Yeah, Oya Kimbrough, he... He, he finished his uh, early training at uh, West Virginia State and he took his law course at uh, Howard University. In Washington. Mrs. Kimbrough is still alive and very, mm -hmm. I think, remarkably active. Mrs. Kimbrough, I see yeah. her frequently. Of course, Mary mm -hmm. died last year, just about a year ago. Mm -hmm. All right, so then after he finished law school, he came back to Charleston. Yes, yeah, yeah. he established a, a law partner. Yeah, he, it was known as. Kimbrough and Chappell, another colored attorney. Mm -hmm. Is he related uh, to any of the Chappells around here now? No, Chappell. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of him before. Yeah, like Chappell, I think he died early, though. I see. Not mistaken. I see. So then he uh, went into your office. Not right at that particular time. No, he had his own office. Where was it located, do you remember? He, he had a law office and he practiced mostly from his home. After then, at, at uh, one time he had an office on Capitol Street, mm -hmm. near the corner of Capitol and Virginia Street. So when did he come uh -huh. up with you? Well, uh, I don't remember the exact year, but he was uh, associated with me for several years. Until his death, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. I remember him. I remember Mr. Kimbrough as a little girl. I can see him with a cigar. Didn't he smoke a cigar a lot? Mm -hmm. I can remember a man with a cigar for some reason. So, uh, my mother, Mrs. Margaret Brown, although she was born slave, Never, she never learned to read or write. Take your men out, Dad. Your, your men will distract your tape. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing I do remember. She was very religious in a way because she taught all of us children to pray, to say one little prayer, which goes like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now, she saw that we kids repeated that prayer before we got in bed. Because if we didn't, she said, did you say your prayers? <laughs> well, if you didn't, get right up there, <laughs> get right up there and say your prayers. <laughs> and, and, we, we, and she added to the prayers, God bless Mother and father. You and Mr. Kimbrough uh, went to Gal Police a lot because you took me down a lot. And I remember you're telling about an incident about some butter and some oleo. Tell, recall that, if you will, Dad. What yeah. say? On 
one occasion see I don't know whether we was up after we were married I think it was yeah because I was with you mm. yeah we used to <coughs> we uh, we used to spend quite a few s Sundays in uh, Gallup Police of Hire, the home of of uh, my wife's parents, Mr. and, and Mrs. John Casey. On I remember one Sunday. Was that was that Mr. Kimbrough or Mr. Payne, incidentally? No, it was Kimbrough. Yeah, all right. I remember one Sunday we drove down to Gallup Police. My wife and I to visit her parents, and we took. Lawyer Kimbrough with us, and Mrs. Casey was an excellent cook, and she had a big dinner for us that Sunday afternoon. Oh. Nice big hot homemade rolls and chicken and all of the fiction that went with it. And I remember, <laughs> remember Mr. Kimbrough was very fond of hot rolls and he was eating Enjoying those rolls and had them all buttered up, and he, and he said he was he was so pleased with the rolls and the butter. He said, uh, "This certainly is good country butter, Mr. Casey." And, and I spoke and said, yes, it certainly is. And Mrs. Casey said, well, well Mr. Brown, Mr. Kimbrough, that's not country butter, that's the oleo. <laughs> Kimbrough never got through teasing me about not being able to tell uh, country, uh, country butter from oleo. So, <laughs> He always, the <laughs> time he went to the police, he, he he had to bring that up about about uh, him calling Oreo country butter. <laughs> 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 You haven't said much about your association with the First Baptist Church, Dad. You, uh, this year, you were named uh, Chairman Emeritus of the Trustee Board, uh, and uh, Mr. Elijah Edwards is now serving as Chairman of the Trustee Board. Do you remember how many years you served as Chairman of the Trustee Board? I know they presented you with a plaque last year as having been a member of the First Baptist Church having served faithfully for more than 50 years. How many years was on that plaque? Was it 70? I'll have to read it again. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was 70 years. But whatever, uh, we'll, I'll get that uh, information from the plaque that's hanging in your office now. It's a beautiful plaque with a cross projected from the surface of it. But uh, when were you baptized? And who was baptized with you and where? Do you remember any incidents surrounding that? Yes, I was baptized under 
the pastor of Reverend G. B. Howard. And it was a Sunday on a Sunday morning after service. During the month of January, we we practiced the entire class of boys that Mrs. Uh, Matilda Parker was our teacher. The number of the boys that were baptized, I can remember, was George Howard, Lafayette Scott, Any of those people have relatives oh, wait a minute. that you remember now, here now? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm trying to think who was before. <coughs> Did I mention Charles Bullard? No. Charles Bullard, that was related to Miss Emma Bullard and mm-hmm. her s- sister. Uh, 
the church was split by a preacher by the name of Wells. He, he took from our church about a hundred and eight or ten of our members. And, and, and among that bunch was a, the woman that taught me in Sunday school, Mrs. Matilda Parker. And, uh, and uh, I said to Miss Parker, I said, when I found that she was going to leave the church, I said, Miss Parker, you know, years ago when I was a boy, 13 years, 12 or 13 years of age, you taught a bunch of us boys in your Sunday school class, including Charlie Bullard. Andrew Brown, Charlie Wade, Lafayette Scott, and I can't think of all of the boys that you taught. So now are you going to leave? Going to leave this church that you were brought up in and taught taught, taught Sunday school in for years? Going to follow this man, Reverend Wells? She said, "Well, yes, Anderson, I." I just don't like the way Mr. Boyd is doing. I said, well, I said regardless of that, I said, you, I don't think you should leave your, this church that you were brought up in and, and taught Sunday school in for years. Well, anyhow, well, she she left. What 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 was she unhappy about with Mr. Boyd? Oh, well, I don't know. She just had some fault with Mr. Boyd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's now Liberty Church. It's located on uh, Lewis Street, mm -hmm. in the 1400 block yeah. of, of Lewis Street. And I think a Reverend Tatum, if I'm not mistaken, is the name of the pastor I, there I now. Don't know who. Mm -hmm. But that's why Wells took a hundred and some of our members. I remember Reverend <laughs> Wells was he had a nice son named Charles, and he had several daughters, too. Yeah. One of his is married with... Of, of tapes with with Bart, who just arrived from Nice, uh, by way of the um, uh, Italian liner Michelangelo, with Dump and with Granddad. We're tasting at this particular point. Let's see what we have. What we have here actually is four gallons of wine that Granddad made a long, long time ago. We're tasting. <laughs> we think that they are of grape and uh, and what's the other one? Peach, grape and peach. One has been eliminated. It's turned to vinegar. But the other three are are here waiting their their fate. Uh, what do you think about them, Bart? How do, what do they what do they really taste like as a connoisseur? They're delicious. They're delicious. Uh, 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 why don't you have them give the recipe? The recipe. Dad, um, tell us how you made that wine. How do you make wine? You said you don't need a recipe. Well, we'd like to know what it is if it's causing all these uh, comments. How, how do you really make it? Well, first thing you do is you, you, you get your, your if you're going to make grapes, and you slice them up. See, take them off the stem, shell them off. And take them in your hand, squash them up, smash them up. Then you then you put, uh, put them in a jar. I use a, use a stone jar. Crock. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <coughs> and uh, put them in a portion of water, maybe a probably a gallon, or two gallon of water, and let, <coughs> let them let it ferment. Let it, let it ferment for oh, 10 or 15 days. And then you squeeze it off, put it in the cloth, squeeze it, squeeze it off, and, and add your sugar. Add your sugar. Of course, you have to, you have to taste it every now and then see if, if, if it's not turning sour, you see. And let, and let it ferment. And you, you, you have to ferment for several days, and you clean the top off to let it 
settled to come to the top, clean it off, taste it, and see if it, see if it's there. Uh, if it's not turning sour, maybe add a little, a little more sugar. Let it, let it stand for several days. Screen, let it, it's, it's seasoned. Till it finishes fermenting, and it's all right. But you can't, you can't cork it up too soon. And <laughs> <laughs> when I was in Boston, I lost a whole five gallon, yeah. <laughs> five gallon jug of wine. How'd that happen? Uh, we, well, we we uh, I was, we were living down on 660 Brookline Street, <laughs> and I was working at the market at the time, and uh, <coughs> we uh, I had it up there, and we, uh, we, we sealed it up, put the cap on it too tight, see, and uh, that thing it, it, it was fermenting, no gas form on it. Popped over. <laughs> five and, gallons? Yeah, for a big, for a big glass, five gallon glass uh, of bottles. That's a great business. And, <coughs> and I had it, I had it down, downstairs. With a, 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 we were upstairs, and I, I um, smelled this. Uh, I smelled it, got the fumes from it, you know. And I said, well, "What's up? What's happened?" <laughs> 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 They could brush it off the lawn. Lost that old five gallon jug. Didn't do any. Wine. Where, where'd you have it then? Had it in the basement downstairs. You were more worried about the wine than <laughs> worried about the damage to we, the basement. We, we were living at 660 Brooklyn, Brookline Street. Yeah. In Cambridge. In Cambridge, yeah. That's why, that's why they're papered, Mr. Brown. Huh? That's why you got the paper. So they blow, blow the paper out rather than. Yeah. No, not now, but that's why I had it in there. Well, roughly how long does that process take there? From the time you uh, put it into ferment oh, the first time, what's, what's oh. the minimum time? Oh, about 30, 30 days, I imagine. 30 days. Depending on the days. temperature, you know, or you know, if it's warm, real warm, it'll ferment faster if it's cool. Mm -hmm. But ordinary, about 30 days. Now, when you put those grapes in after you've washed them and stemmed them and oh, all, yeah, yeah. Do, you put, do you cover them over with water? Huh? Do you, oh, you, you oh, do yeah, cover yeah. them just enough to cover them? No, you put it put in if you want to make a five gallon. It depends on the quantity of grapes you have. See. Mm -hmm. If you have, say, a gallon, well, one gallon of, of, of shell grapes will make probably two gallons, at least two gallons of, uh, of uh, wine. So you sort of more. try a one to two yeah. ratio, one of grapes and two of water, roughly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's about right. Then you can add more water to it if you want it. If you want it weakened, you can add more water after you can it after it, after it, it uh, stops fermenting. Or you can dilute it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But each time you do something to it, you strain it. You put it through a strain. Is that what makes it clear? Yeah, you've got there's lots of settlement in it. You're going to have to strain it. Strain mm -hmm. it. That's Maybe where you're going to have it more, more than mm -hmm. one, you know. I can remember as a child going in the kitchen and seeing all this straining process around there. I, I really can. Yeah. You, uh, the grapes, the chitlins, and what else? Can I you don't want to, when you strain it, you don't want to squeeze it, put it in a the, the cheese cloth on it, and pour it, and put it over the top of the uh, jar that you're straining it in, and, and let, it, uh, let it seep through, see? Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think about well, that, Barb? That, that You'll try get, that when you go back. That way you don't get any <laughs> settlements in it. Mm -hmm. When you don't squeeze it, just let it drain through. Yeah. Now, well, while we're talking here, you want to tell us a little bit about that home brew? Because I can remember more things happening down that basement besides root beer. <laughs> yeah, we used to make home brew. Mm -hmm. Big old jars down there now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wondering where I could find the truck. <laughs> yeah. How'd you do that, Dad? Oh, I don't, I don't I can't remember all about that. I never made so very much of it. I never. Much to drink. I used to make it most of it. Most of it kicked over the set. You see, mm -hmm. you can see it. I haven't, we haven't used it because I mm -hmm. came out of my sister's and I'm probably some of that six, seven years old. See, mm -hmm. she never drank it, but we just had it here. I, until, until your son in law and son came down to visit, they'd always look for it around here. Remember Christmas, <laughs> Thanksgiving dinners we used to have down here? They'd come looking for it. Mm -hmm. Well, Dad, what about that blackberry cordial? I can remember whenever I got sick on the stomach, I always came up with some blackberry cordial from someplace. Did you make that too? Uh, blackberry, blackberry wine, yeah. Did you make that? The same procedure? Yeah, I never made much, never made much blackberry. She always, she always made preserves of them, <laughs> blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> Turn over the wine. <laughs> well, I can remember she always had it around, though, because whenever I got sick on the stomach, 
But you come up with some a little bit of glass of some some blackberry cordial, blackberry something. I was never intoxicated but once in my life. I was when I was about sixteen, and we were living right here in North Ranch, right off the of Summer Street. There used to be a couple of little old four room cottages there. See? We were living in one of those cottages. I was working at a grocery store down at at, at uh, old man Lloyd's grocery store, and uh, <clears throat> I, I got a, I got a lot of uh, grapes. I mean blackberry wine. Blackberry, I made wine, blackberry wine, and a bunch of us fellows on Christmas Eve, we got together and thought we'd get out and have a little celebration. <laughs> How old were you then? Uh, about 15 or 16. That's something. And uh, we uh, so I went around my house, uh, so was like John Reilly, Joe Reilly, and Trust Tinsley, I think. Went out my house, and we, we, we drank some. I got this wine out, we all drank some of this wine, and then we left there, we, used to, we were playing in the band at the time, we used to practice over on Dryden Street, and went over there to the band room and drank some, well, and Crump, Andrew Crump lived there, he gave us some wine, something there, and on a Christmas Eve, see. Then we all feeling pretty good, we went downtown, in those days the saloons were all open then, see, and we, and we went in the, in the saloon, and, and bought some beer, and drank some beer, and mixed it up with that wine. And boy, talk about sick. I was, <laughs> I was sick in my life. I was, all I was pretty well teed up. So uh, we, we went on back up and went, I was, I couldn't hardly walk, so the boy wanted to take me home. I said, no, don't take me home. I don't want my mother to see me. That's just not to go home. <laughs> So, so, so I was. So it took me out here on Dryden Street, out the our, our band where we used to practice. Man took me out there, and and, she, and uh, this fellow Andrew Crump, he lived in one part of this house. So, so basically, he, he took the old man had to go down right on the bed, and, and uh, so they they left me there, and uh, come back after about about seven seven or seven thirty that night. And, I got up and washed my face. I was still feeling lightheaded. <laughs> 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 and so, so it was, it was having a, you t <coughs> those days you used to have a Christmas tree at church, you know, and give all the kids presents. Give you a little old plate of saucer, cup and saucer, or some kind of little present. All this was Sunday school classes, you know. And uh, so I was, I was up there at the church. And, and when they called my name to go up and get my present, I couldn't hardly walk. Oh, for heaven's sake. Well, I finally got up there and got my little present, come on back. And, and, and I feel pretty good then. And my sister Ruth and uh, Roseanne Reedley, that was a, one of the girlfriend of hers. So finally I went on home then, come on back up there. And I, Next morning, I was still sick as a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Did your mother ever find out about it? No. Uh, and it was a long time before, if I would even go past the saloon and look in the window and see that whiskey sitting in the window, it'd make me sick. <laughs> <laughs> that cured me. I, I was the first and last time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I never had any more use for whiskey. I just get sick if I go and look in the window. You keep pushing your own display in the window, you know, all this brown. Look at that face. Make me sick and even look at it. Were there very many saloons in town, Mr. Brown? Huh? Were there very many saloons? Oh, yeah. All along this, let's see, right on Capitol Street, there was right there where Plum and Tony's shoe store was along the other was one there. And on a little further down, a little further down the street, right across from the the uh, ten cent store there was one on that on the on the left hand side going down the street. There's two right along there, and they're all on around on the corner of uh, Virginia and Summer Street. There's one there, and Ben Barr had a wholesale place on the corner of Summers and Canary Street. He supplied a lot of the saloons with the whiskey. You know. Bear? Bear, yeah. Frank, Frank, Frank Bear, 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 Bear is yeah. from. Yeah. Not Frank, that Frank's grandfather, mm -hmm. Ben Barry. He built those houses on the corner of, of Bradford and uh, and uh, and Coria Street, a little big brick. Yeah, big yeah, yeah, brick. He built all those houses along on that side there. Built for the big big entrance at home, that big 
like brick house, and he built some apartments right joining it. He was a wholesaler. Huh? He was a wholesaler. Yeah, he was a wholesaler. Yeah. yeah. And in later days, uh, Mr. Terry and and Bush, they had a saloon on Summer Street between uh, between uh, Virginia and Kanawha Street. It's kind of a little negro business section in there. George Barney used to have a pool room in there, and Bush, T.B. Bush. Was that, was that business integrated? Huh? Black and white business? Most of the Negroes, see. Mm -hmm. Everything was Jim Crow. Some of these saloons wouldn't serve the Negroes. See. I don't know, we went to the saloon once and bought, and bought, <coughs> bought something to drink, and the old, old bartender, after he served it, but after he served it, broke the glass. Yeah. 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 Was it was Broke the glass. Oh, really? What'd you do? Huh? What'd you, what was your reaction? Well, what could you do? In other words, it wasn't much I know about it. Did you go back? Did you ever go back? No, I wouldn't. I never bought anywhere because I don't know how you happen to go in there. But then there was another place on the on Kenora Street between uh, between Capitol and Summer Street. Uh, uh, that's all name that uh, forget his name now. Anyhow, he used we used to we used to sell uh, cheese sandwiches, Limburger cheese. Now, is that where you got your taste uh, for Limburger? Yeah, and uh, real Limburger. <laughs> we, uh, we used to go there and, and, and get these Limburgers that we used to be shining shoes around there, and only get all those diamonds, so we'd go in and get a Limburger cheese sandwich. <laughs> the whole part of his head still coming down. He, he's so funny. He's saying, he's having cut that stinky cheese. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you boys come up with one old stinking cheese. Uh, <laughs> T.D. Henderson and I, we were, we were right together almost the time. T.D. Henderson, Lockett, Scott. We used to shine shoes around there. Yeah, we, used, we used to get up a Sunday morning to go down, <coughs> down on Capitol Street oh, about 8 o'clock. Shine shoes, make maybe 25 or 50 cents, something like that, and on back home, you can go to Sunday school, but it'll be Sunday school about 9 30, 10 o'clock. Miss Parker, uh, Eva Hatch's mother, mm -hmm. she was our Sunday school teacher. Miss, Miss, Miss Matilda Parker. She had a bunch of us for you Andrew, Andrew Brown, and Young Wade, and George Howard, he was the pastor's son, a bunch of Bunch of us boys there. And, and when, they, when we had that big church fight on here, Miss Parker still was living. She left our church and went up at the Liberty. She was she was living right next to on the corner. She owned that probably on the corner of, of uh, Court and Donna Street, or where the Metropolitan that, Church is. That church fight was fairly late though, wasn't it? Brown was no. about 1940, wasn't it? <coughs> what was that? The what? The, 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 when the church split this time. First, uh, the, when the, the first of oh, 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 You mean when the first Baptist went on, uh, Hen on what's the name, Wells Street? Mm -hmm. After the thirties? I don't know, just what they call it. Do you remember that, Jack? Because mm -hmm. we lived right across the street from Wells. He lived beside the schoolhouse. We, uh, we were on Sugar. Wells, Wells split the church, and, and uh, Miss Parker. I said to uh, Miss Parker, "You going to leave our ch church now? You, 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 you taught me in Sunday school, and now you going to you going to follow with us?" Yes, Anderson. I just hate to leave, but I just don't like Mr. Board. I don't like the way he's the way he's done. She, she, <laughs> she fought well up there, <laughs> and, and she and I, Miss Parker and I, in later years, when the when the Metropolitan Church was built out there, Miss Parker and I, we we in Dorset. You know what I was running? I was back here from Boston, man. And I was had a meat market right there on the corner of Browns Alley and, and Court Street, so they had to have three thousand dollars to buy some secondhand brick from the Kenora Bank and Trust Company. They were turning, they, they were re, uh, was rebuilding there, and so Miss Park and I, we we endorsed note to give them to get those bricks for that for that church. Reverend Woody was here, here then. I've heard that name. Yeah, he's up in Pennsylvania now. But the church building no, was Reverend Wood, Reverend Wood, uh, Jones, Dr. Jones, those bright fellow, you remember him now. He, was, he, was a, he had a couple of boys named Lorraine and, and uh, Lorraine, and I forget the other boy's name. The boy named Lorraine? Uh, Lorraine Jones. Mm -hmm. He finally left here. He finally, in those days, uh, 
lots of uh, drug addicts out there. They used to administer uh, morphine to them. Used to shoot them. You know, charge them I think fifty cents or a dollar for. And and Jones had it. Right by that little, by Doctor Jones, Doctor Morris's office. Well, that's that. He built that little room in there. Doctor Jones, and uh, and they used to guys go there and get dope, line up and shoot that morphine and the cocaine where it was in, in the arms. And, I didn't uh, know drugs had been a problem that long. Huh? I didn't know drugs had been a problem that long. Oh yeah, and, uh, and years ago they used to just uh, regular call it cocaine fiends. They get all that dope and just fall out. And uh, lots of them would uh, have the needles and administer themselves, you know. But mm -hmm. Dr. Jones, he... He specialized in it. Yeah, he, 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 he <laughs> line up there to go to him to get that shot. Who, what, what Dr. Jones was that? Oh, that was, oh, that was J.R. Jones. He died. He died up in California. He had, had two boys, named, uh, John and Lorraine. And... Uh, he left here. Funny, he funny. He told me I was at I had the meat market across the street from him at the time. But I brought him back here from Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, not Jr. though. Jr. Yeah. was Julia's father. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and he said to me, he said, I said I'm gonna. I, said, I told him I stop. You ought to stop selling these. Not selling that, giving those guys that dope. He said, oh, I said I've made my mind. I'm gonna make some money if I have to go to prison. But well, I guess he went to prison too. They, they, they put a they, they put a drive on here to stamp off that those uh, those uh, morphines and dope that they were giving them and they, they put a big drive on and arrested him and oh, several other doctors here. And I know he got two years uh, two years down in Atlanta. Old Judge McClinic sentenced him down in Atlanta. Uh, but he built that little room in our uh, little place built out of second hand brick he got from the same time we was parking our <laughs> got the money for the build the, 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 the old church there. Well, let's get his name straight, though, Dad. It wasn't J.R. Jones, because J.R. was Julia's no, father. No, not J.R. Uh, w.L. W.L. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he he went down to serve his time down at Atlanta, <coughs> come back here, and he and uh, he finally moved to moved to Los Angeles. Did he still have his nest egg of money? He must have as he moved to California. Yeah, he, yeah, he, well, it didn't take much money in those days, those things were cheap, you know. Mm -hmm. So he he uh, left here and went, went out to California. I guess those boys are out there now, I suppose. Uh, but uh, his wife, she was a big, stout, bright woman. You see, did she die here? Did she? I think she probably. Tell you, she was, she was, his wife was, uh, was uh, a niece of a. Uh, Listen, Colonel Cannon's wife, I believe. Uh, either, either, yeah, I think she was niece of Colonel, Colonel Cannon's wife down at the Institute. Mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> Mr. Brown, what did he do? What did he do with the young man, Colonel? Uh -huh. What did Colonel do with the young man, Colonel? Mm -hmm. well, he was a maintenance man at State College. He was a wheelwright. He, he taught uh, blacksmithing and wheelwright. He, he finished down at uh, Tuskegee. So. He, he, uh, he come here from Tuskegee, and, and he, he worked at schools. In those days, they had a lot of, lot of horses and wagons, you know, and he, he taught the boys how to, how to repair yeah, the wagons and fix the wheels. And, and he's a carpenter, too, so he can do carpenter work. Well, you know, they've got the new education building up on the lot there. It's almost finished down at State College now, where his house was. Yeah. And they've moved his house back this direction, he near the edge of that lot. He built that little cottage for me right over the, right over the fence from the, uh, from the uh, athletic field there, the old athletic field. There was a little cottage there. That little greenhouse? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh, he, he and a boy named Arthur Noel, they built that for me for, 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 for Willis Mother. We lived there a while. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, he and Arthur Noel, they built that. Uh, and I finally, <coughs> and when, uh, when, the, when I bought the lot on the south side of the hill, so where Joyce lives now, mm -hmm. uh, Willard's mother selected the, the uh, design for that house. Uh, and uh, 
in 1918, right after World War One, I built that house, and uh, then I <coughs> I rented a, a cottage, and finally I eventually sold it to uh, Professor Matthews. Mm -hmm. No, I sold it. I first sold it to to uh, Hackbridge, to Jim uh, Jim Hackbridge. They owned that place they own on uh, Washington Street, right where Captain Gamble's place is on the corner. Near yeah, Bradford? It, on the corner of Bradford and, mm -hmm. and Washington. Well, there was a big old frame house right on the back. Uh, uh, I owned that, and I sold that. Let's see. I, I sold that to... I first sold it... No, I sold it to Hackridge, who was Hackridge, a uh, man, Jim Hackridge. He had a couple of, uh, uh, he married a woman that had boys always in trouble, Homer Robertson. You might have known, known Homer Robertson. I forget the other boy's name. But they, they, they were always in trouble, see. And uh, I sold her and, and, and uh, no, I didn't, did I sell her? No, yeah, I sold her to, to to Miss Hackley. No, Hackley's owned it. Hackley, Hack, I, I bought it from Hackley. That's where I got hold of it. But they were going to, they were, they were going to uh, cover this full clothes on. And I, I uh, made a deal to, uh, to, to buy it. I bought it to her and give her, she owed $6,000 on it, see. And they were going to cover it with full clothes on it. And so <coughs> I traded her, gave her a little cottage right over the fence down at Institute, and I owned all those lots, of, of the whole four lots there, see. And I gave her that, that house and, and those the cottage, those four lots, and a, and a, and a cow. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd the cow come in, Mr. Brown? I, guess. I, I, had three, I had three or four cows down there. <laughs> I gave her all that, and it's it all clear. Now, the fact that those boys are always in trouble, never mortgage their property and borrowing money and paying fines for them. Now, don't you? Now, this property all, and I assume she owes six thousand dollars. I I assume the mortgage on this place, okay? and uh, gave her that place down there clear. Nice, you know, big lots in it, big garden spot and everything. Really a nice place. For I said, don't you allow those boys to, 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 to uh, if they get in trouble, let them go to jail. Don't let them get you, have your mortgage in your property. All right, Mr. Brown, I won't. All right. She, she moved down there and kept them on the fine. And finally, the boys began to get in trouble. She began to bar, bar. And, and uh, finally, See what, what happened. And I don't any any at any, any rate she 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 lost the place. See, and uh, and Professor Matthews bought it. They they, they bought it and and, uh, and and I I sold the place up there. I sold it to the Mason, Mark Carver and Chris Campbell. They were big men in the, in the Masonic Lodge. What what was Campbell's first name? Chris. Oh no, man. Chris Campbell. He's a big, bright fellow. You, you remember Jim Copper's father, Mark? I remember Mark Copper. Yeah. Well, uh, they uh, they were big men in the in the Masonic Lodge. See. I sold it to them for twenty one thousand dollars, and they paid me. A, I don't know just how much they paid me down on it, and uh, and uh, let's see. I think I. I kept it quite. I, I had it rented, rented, had it rented to, to one or two people. A big old house for it. So finally, after I sold it, then I turned it over to them. And uh, I, I think I, I sold my notes. They paid me so much cash, and I, and I, and I gave me eight or ten thousand dollars in notes. And I sold it, sold it. My notes to uh, Lou Whirley, 
who was at that time, he was president of the, of the, of the, of the National Bank of Commerce. No. Canal that? Bank and Trust. No, it's not in existence now. That People's was, Bank. People's Bank. Yeah. yeah. How you know? <laughs> yeah. he was, he, How you know he, about? Who was president of the bank? Well, I used to tell him all my notes. He'd take a big discount off you to cut him quite a bit, you know. And so, so I said, see, uh, what are you going to do? I take, I got to take fifteen percent off of that. I said, oh yeah, you want, you know, you want too much. I'm not going to give you that much of a discount. And he says, let me get it. He said, oh, Anderson, let me tell you something. He said, whenever he was funny kind of a fellow, he was a German guy, he said, whenever you sell a piece of property, always add on a little extra for Uncle Lou. <laughs> 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 that was his name, Lou Early. Yeah. <laughs> always add on a little extra for Uncle Lou. <laughs> so I sold Uncle Lou the notes on that and got my, my, my money out of it. And, and then the, the, the Masons, they took over. They, they had had it for quite a while. And finally, they, they got behind their payments. And uh, they got to fight among themselves in the large. So finally they lost it. The large, the uh, Lou Hurley foreclosed on them. He called me and told me, he said, so those fellas won't pay me? He said, so, so, so Mark Carpenter called me up one of those one when he was making an appointment with me. He said, my door is always open. We're not making an appointment. You don't come on. Come on, come on in. <laughs> Tell him to come on in. He wants us to meet when they're He's out here all the time. He said, come on in. He had his office up. He was president of the bank, you know, and he had his, his office up, upstairs. That's all people building. Yeah, people building. So they lost it anyhow. Then uh, it uh, went up for sale. Well, I was thinking on, they, they only owned about $5,000 on it, so I, I was thinking on. Uh, getting in a bit of bonded, bonded back, see. But another guy uh, uh, that was, a, was a connected with the bank, with the uh, Capital City Bank at the time, he, he, uh, what was his name? Can't think of his name, but anyhow, he got, got ahead of him and he, he bought it, see. Uh, and I tried to get it from him, but he and I couldn't get together on it, so he sold it to his father, Eckleberry. Uh, Uncle, uh, Uncle Barry. Uncle Barry. Heating and plumbing. He sold it to them. But you know they tore it down just this past year. Yeah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. well, that, that's the place I, I own that. I remember that's where we used to have our breakfast dances when we were in high uh -huh. school. You remember that, Don? Mm -hmm. You didn't, that day, uh, have that remember, bar. Yeah. You remember Bloomberg? And yeah, they had a, 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 they took out some petitions upstairs, I think. They made a, made a large room of it. There wasn't any excuse for them losing it, though, because Hurley was giving them a good deal on it, but they got to fight among themselves, see? Who was going to get the money? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. I agree with that. This, uh, this, this Brown has some interesting dealings with Mr. Bloomberg's father. Is there any Mr. Brown? <laughs> <laughs> When you beat me, <laughs> he beat me early in the game, taught me a lesson. <laughs> huh? What did he do? <coughs> well, he, I, I just started, that's 1918, World War, World War One. see. He, uh, he was dicking around in real estate, and I had just started to selling and buying stuff, mostly selling, and uh, I worked up a deal on some land down at West Dunbar. There was three tracts of land down there, about, about three acres in each tract. <laughs> now, well, uh, uh, <laughs> they're getting a little more wine. Dad said he didn't realize that he was being taped here while we was doing all this discussion. <laughs> so Francis mentioned uh, some transaction that Dad had had with Bloomberg, the former Secretary of the Musicians Union until he died here when last year with the father, Mr. Bloomberg. Bloomberg, the Musicians Union Secretary, died when in 1969? 68. In 68. Has it been that long? And Bart asked Dad to tell him a little bit about that. So the tape has been changed and raring to go, Dad. So you tell us about, continue that discussion about you and Mr. Bloomberg. The three tracks of land and Bloomberg's. Well, I knew, I knew old man Bloomberg very well. 
And uh, we entered into a, an agreement that if I, if I would get an option on this land, he would furnish the money to buy it, and we would sell it and, and divide the profit. Well, one of these owners lived in Huntington. I contacted her, got a, an option to purchase her. Her name was, was, was Nana, Nana Bird, Nanny Bird, I think it was. And uh, one of the other owners lived in Bluefield. I contacted them and got an option to purchase their three acres. And uh, she owned that other truck. I can't think of the name of the owner of the other truck. At any, at any rate, they were approximately nine acres altogether. And uh, this Mrs. Jackson, at the time she was living in Huntington, And uh, some told me that I'd better get a written agreement from Mr. Bloomberg before I <laughs> put him in touch with these owners. See? And he kept stalling me off, but finally he and I went to Huntington to see this Mrs. Jackson down at Huntington that owned one of the tracks. And I said, now listen, before we to sign up before I take you to see Mr. Jackson, you and I are going to have a written agreement. <laughs> so we went to, a, went to a lawyer's office in Huntington. The name of the lawyers was Strickland and Strickland, and had them to write up an agreement that between Bloomberg and myself. All right, that was prepared. We, and then we went up and saw Mrs. Jackson got her option. And uh, of course that this agreement included the, the other two tracks too, so you put the nine acres all together. Now our understanding was that he was to put up the money for this land and I was to sell it and we were after paying him his uh, his uh, purchase price money and taking out his, his cost for the purchase price, then we were to divide equally the profit, see. Well, I had a sale for the land. I, it cost us all together a little $4,000, see, for the, for the three trucks of land. But I had, I had a purchase for it for $8,000. That was long 1918, when everything was humping down there. Then the night was in full bloom. Everybody was buying land, had plenty of money. Well, and so I told them in Bluebird, and I said, I've got to purchase for it. I said, we can clear, we can clear about $2,000 a piece. Oh, no, hold on to it, hold on to it. We, we can get more than that, we, we can get more than that for it. I said, no, you better, better let it go now. We, 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 that was probably what the fellow of Clark was, name was George, Lee George was going to buy it, was mm -hmm. going to give us $8,000 for it. A old man wouldn't agree to sell. And, and he wanted to hold it till we'd get 10000 And we kept filling around. And, and a few days later, the, the, the armistice was signed. <laughs> <laughs> On the side, the bottom, the bottom dropped out. <laughs> Could, couldn't get it. <laughs> and so, all oh, right, I said, now you see, I mean, if we'd have $2,000 people, no, you, you, you refuse to sell. So, well, we can, we can get what you could hardly give land away down there after the honest was signed. Night over, get the clothes down, you know. And, and so, <clears throat> The man that's going to buy said, well, folks, I don't, I can't, you don't want it now. You had a chance to, to get rid of it, but 
So old man said, well, we'll hold on to it. We'll, so I was at, at the Hong Fire for, well, for quite a while. I, I said, Kemper, I said, I don't know what to do, brother. Nothing, nothing ought to do as long as, because there's no market for that land down there now. It's all vacant land. So went along and uh, <coughs> finally old man Bloomberg, he, he sold it to a fellow named J.W. Cart. He sold it to Cart, who was in the real estate business. He had a lot of subdivisions around here. He sold a Cart for $6,000. Well, he, he told me he only got 5000 for it, see. Well, Cart, well, I knew Cart was a good friend of mine, a white fellow, and he told me, I, I, I asked him, what, what, what did he pay him when blue blew the I gave him $6,000. So I paid him $1,000 down, and was supposed to pay him $1,000 every, every six months or something like that. So he told me he'd only got, he just wanted to get, wanted to get me a, about, a, <laughs> about $500. He was going to give me for the other five. Yeah, so, so I, I told him, well, I said, listen, I, I said, you, <coughs> you can't jip me. I'm not sure you can get away with that. <laughs> I said, uh, J. W. McCarthy told me that he'd given you six thousand dollars for that man. I want a thousand dollars. Oh, he didn't give me. He he told me because I said, no, he used to tell me that the court said he he had a contract you to give you pay you a thousand six thousand dollars, thousand dollars down, and a thousand dollars every six months, or something like that. See, well. So I, Kimbrough was in my office at the time, so I said, Kimbrough filed a suit against that old man, I said, <laughs> so, so he did, we filed a suit against him, and old man Bloomberg filed a petition in bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he filed a petition in bankruptcy. You didn't get the 500, did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> and so then he, <clears throat> and then two or three other, uh, 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 Creditors jumped on him, see, and uh, and uh, it all messed up that so. So well, I said that's just lost that so. <clears throat> and uh, and he manipulated around then, and when it, when it went up for sale, he had a daughter living up in Boston. And I didn't know her name anyhow. And this boy Reuben, they they uh, manipulated around this girl. She she. Bit in the old man's stuff. He owned, he, owned, he owned quite a bit of property around town. See, uh, so this girl bit in the stuff, his daughter, and later on she turned it over to, to Reuben and, 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 yeah. and, and the other boy. See. And then they, uh, they uh, held on to it for years. The finally they cut it up, cut it up in lots and sold it. It, it, it's right off, I'll be at my place down there. I've seen the land track in the union office. I know where it is. Yeah. Where is it? Right, almost off this Brown Park, on the hillside. No, no, it was in the bottom. It was in the bottom. On the other side. You know where you go down that road to go over on the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it lands on the, uh, right off to the left. It's in the, it's, a lot of it's low land, low, a lot of it's bad, but uh, there's some good land. So, so Reuben, but he he finally laid off in, in lots and sold it out. When, when did you buy the Brown Park land, Mr. Brown? I bought the first track. See, that's the three different tracks of land. Mm -hmm. there, see. I bought the first track in the sea. Let's see when did it have. Uh, must have been about in 21, 22, something like it, the first track. And I, that's down where the beer fall is now. Mm -hmm. that's, there's five acres in that track. That's the lower end, see. So we back up on the hill, back where our world lives. Mm -hmm. and then I, three or four later, years later, I, I bought the, the, the other joining track. And then a few years later, I bought the, the other, the other, <laughs> the other <laughs> four. That's the one right here. He presented the, that's where, he, that's where I was telling Bart that you, you did the state road, the state road, and put the field in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's valuable land there now. That's way where he moved the creek. How far did you move the creek, Mr. Brown? Mm -hmm. When you rerouted the creek? Oh, we moved that creek all the way, all the way back to the other side. <laughs> uh, six, seven hundred feet. <laughs>
Well, the classes they filled up, they moved it, they, they moved it three times for me. Because uh, two they fill up in one section and they move it over, we push it over. <laughs> <the other side>. <laughs> 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 we rode by there and I was talking about yeah. it in the creek. Yeah. yeah, a guy had an option on it here, this, this, this Cummins Machinery Company, he probably, well he wouldn't know about it, but anyhow, they, they had an option on about four acres, four acres and a half of it there for $17,000 an acre. I've got $1,000 of money now and now, they, they, they decided they wouldn't go to take it, see, it was about seventy some thousand dollars So I said, well, I said, he, he, he gave me, uh, I've got, a, you've got an option on it, uh, nothing wrong with the title, but if I had a clause, I know that it happened to be.